Welcome to part two of The Music That Made Me, where I'm focusing on a selection of albums that have had significance in my life. They may not be critical darlings, but they were important to me and spoke to me at a specific time in my life, whether good or bad. If you haven't seen part one yet, my childhood years, be sure to check out the link in the description below. My teenage years, where I really started to form my own tastes and started paying closer attention to music, how it was structured, so then I could write my own music. This is also when I started to pick up the guitar for the first time, around seventh or eighth grade, and when I also started tinkering with some other instruments as well. Of course, the extreme range of emotions that are going on during this time in our lives has definitely a huge influence on the type of music that I and many people are listening to. That's a huge reason why we call it teenage angst. But then too, after those early volatile years, we can branch off and start to listen to something entirely different. For me personally, it was a lot of indie rock, even some hip hop, and then some softer pop rock at the time as well. As I've been writing down these top 10s for these blocks of time during my life, of course, I've been going well over 10, so I consolidated a little bit, but I still try to think of the first 10, even if there's no rhyme or reason to it. And sometimes there is kind of a logical continuation in some points. And you may see that on this list in particular, where I start off pretty strong with the early angsty stuff, but then start to kind of mellow out as I get into more of the soft rock mellow stuff. So without further ado, let's dive right in. Green Day, American Idiot. It. Ask anybody that knew me in high school. My freshman and sophomore year, I was obsessed with Green Day. This was the record that really got me into the band as I knew them before. I knew the radio singles and I've seen some of the music videos, but this record was the first of theirs that I owned and directly made me want to get into them even further and explore their back catalog. And I borrowed so much of Billy Joe's songwriting playbook when I was going to write my own music. A lot of things I tried to do up until this point may have been a little bit outside of my realm of capability, to be perfectly honest. I'm not that great of a guitar player, but I can play power chords all day long. And that's exactly what Billy Joe does, especially on those early releases. But yeah, American Idiot, I was obsessed with it. I used to know how to play every single song. I loved the narrative that this thing spelled out. I loved the live album, Bullet in a Bible, that they came out with. I was just all about this album, all about this era. And honestly, that's kind of where it ended. I didn't really get into 21st Century Breakdown at all, and I haven't really listened to the band since, but that album and all the albums before definitely hold a special place in my heart. The Who, Who's Next? In high school, there was kind of this renaissance of what we would call classic rock. A lot of my friends were into Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Black Sabbath. And to be perfectly honest, I didn't have that same level of exposure to those bands, but I was able to fall back on one of my dad's favorite bands that I knew pretty well from those road trip days in the van. The Who. And the top two that I always think about are the compilation record Hooligans and this album Who's Next, which came directly off of Tommy, if I recall correctly, and was supposed to be part of this bigger project called the Lifehouse Project by Pete Townsend. But this album is a solid little record without having all of the grandiosity of a rock opera. You have one of the greatest Who songs of all time and probably one of my favorite rock songs of all time. And if you don't believe me, ask Joe Para. Baba O'Reilly, what an amazing, amazing track. That synthesizer arpeggio that introduces this thing is just beautiful, it's magical. Like I can't give you enough words to describe how much and how amazing that sound is for me. And there's another memory that I have directly tied to this one where a lot of kids were going to like Target in the day and getting these classic rock t-shirts. And fortunately for me, my dad actually had a The Kids Are All Right Who t-shirt from their tour back in the 80s, I wanna say. And it fit me maybe a little tight, but that was kind of the style of the time. So I got that shirt and it was an authentic vintage piece. And I remember just flaunting and wearing that thing every chance I could get. It was an awesome one of a kind piece. The Streets Original Pirate Material. If you don't already know, the FIFA video games have some of the best soundtracks for any sport game. Honestly, any game, I'd throw them down with anybody. And it was FIFA 05 where I first heard Fit But You Know It by British MC The Streets. And this song was hilarious. It was such a unique vocal delivery, something I've never heard before in my life. And that constant chugging guitar 
riff was so upbeat, so happy, and I just, I couldn't get enough of it. I wanted to hear the song over and over again. Like a lot of albums during this time where we were in the early days of iTunes, I didn't always have to go to Best Buy or CD Warehouse or Sam Goody to find an album. In fact, sometimes, especially in this case, I couldn't always find what I was looking for. But during this digital era, I was able to go online and find pretty much any record I wanted. That's exactly what I did for The Streets because I wanted to hear more. I wanted to see what else this guy could offer. Well, foolishly, I didn't get the record that Fit But You Know It was on, but I did get the debut album, Original Pirate Material. I do not regret that decision whatsoever. In fact, to this day, I think this is still probably my favorite Streets album. For someone who is only familiar with Fit But You Know It, to hear this opening track turn the page with those rising strings and Mike's philosophical comparisons to Gladiator. You have similar heavy orchestral moments like It's Too Late, Has It Come to This, We Become Heroes. But then you also have some of those lighter moments a little bit more similar to Fit But You Know It, like The Irony of It All and Don't Mug Yourself. An awesome album that hooked me and got me into pretty much everything Mike Skinner's on. Weezer, Pinkerton. So I really wasn't into Weezer per se during this time. Beverly Hills had just come out. It was a pretty big radio hit, but I really couldn't vibe with it. I did, however, love Perfect Situation. I still think that holds up as the highlight of the Make Believe record. I really wanted to kind of dive in and see about their older stuff because I knew songs like Hash Pipe, Island in the Sun, and of course, Buddy Holly. To be perfectly honest, I didn't really know the band outside of that. At the time, my grandfather was really big into burning CDs. He would borrow them from the library and more or less bootleg them. So I asked him, hey, can you get me a Weezer album? But I didn't know what the names of the records were at the time. So before he got me the Blue album, which is the actual record I wanted, he actually gave me Pinkerton first. Much like those initial reviews of the album, I didn't really get into this record. It was it was a tough one for me to get into. In fact, as soon as that opener Tired of Sex comes on with the weird distortion, I was like, I don't think this is what I signed up for. Later, he did give me the Blue Album and I really loved that album front to back when I first got it. So later on, I revisited Pinkerton and said, why don't I give this another chance? Because then I also was armed with the information of how this album was kind of critically panned when it first came out and why it's seen in a better light nowadays. And nowadays it's kind of in a weirder light because of some of the lyrics and some of the topics, but that's neither here nor there for me. I'm just thinking about these memories that I have with the record. So after listening to it again, after being more familiar with the Blue album, and then even some of the later albums like Green and Maladroit, I really got more into it and honestly it started to become my favorite record of the band block party intimacy so at this time there's a bit of a shakeup going on within the record industry you had this hugely successful experiment by the band radiohead with the pay what you want album in rainbows and other artists that were doing it i think maybe even before i know nine inch nails did it and more artists were becoming more empowered to self-release albums and actually making a lot more this way cutting out the middleman of the record company altogether and while not following that model 100%, there was a surprise release with the, I believe, third album by British band Block Party with their album Intimacy. And I'd heard singles from this band, but at the time I didn't own Silent Alarm, nor did I own Weekend in the City, but I knew some of the big singles from them. And I did like the band. Again, they were kind of unique, this blend of alt and punk rock with kind of an indie sensibility to them. To this day, Kayle is one of my favorite vocalists. I really love his timbre and I really love his lyrics as well. He does a great job of being a little bit more ambiguous with his lyrics, something that I've always kind of really appreciated when it comes to songwriting. So this is the first full album of theirs that that I owned. And this was a further adventure into a more experimental territory for the band at the time. You have the amazing album closer, Ion Square, one of my favorite tracks by the band, the really sincere and subtle bell work on signs, the loud, quiet dynamic of Better Than Heaven, and the almost new wave flavors of Talons. As far as a bigger picture of where the band has gone after this record, I think this is definitely a better introduction to the band's overall sound than their debut record as a lot of their stuff features more of these sounds that are hinted at on Intimacy. But of course, that debut record, Silent Alarm, is pretty darn flawless. It just offers a, a different version of the band. Death Cab for Cutie, Narrow Stairs. Honestly, it's not even the band's best album. Plans and Transatlanticism are significantly better, and there's even something 
charming about the lo-fi qualities of the first two records as well. But Narrow Stairs was interesting for me because I followed it in real time. By this point, I was hugely obsessed with the band. Plans was a phenomenal record for me. Crooked Teeth was the first song of theirs that I heard on the radio, and I had to dive into more of their work. So when a new album was announced and this promo single, I Will Possess Your Heart, a near eight minute jam was put out, I was like, where the hell are these guys going? And I do love this record, don't get me wrong. I just don't think it's quite as strong as some of those other releases. And in fact, the only Death Cab vinyl that I own to this day is a 45 promo single of I Will Possess Your Heart. Gnarls Barkley, St. Elsewhere. Crazy was a massive single. Every radio station was playing this thing. Pop radio, alt rock, R&B, this thing was everywhere. And honestly, I wasn't that into it at first. I was still very much of the rock and guitar type music. So at the time this came out, I was like, eh, all right. But luckily I had some friends that were really into this record and shared some of the other cuts with me at the time. And for whatever reason, those other cuts just really clicked. Go Go Gadget Gospel, Smiley Faces, Transformer. These were the cuts that I could dig on. And after that, I had a better appreciation for Crazy listening to it in the context of the whole record. I remember too, I went out and I bought the deluxe edition that came with some other behind the scenes goodies, including all the music videos for the aforementioned songs. Goo Goo Dolls, Gutter Flower. So if you only know the Goo Goo Dolls by name, you probably know the big rock ballads that they're known for. Iris, Name, Slide. These are the songs that really push them into that adult contemporary sort of world that they live in now. But Name was kind of an outlier on that record, A Boy Named Goo. The rest of the songs were a bit more 90s alt rock, kind of grunge tinged. And even their stuff before that, they were kind of a true pop punk outfit. And I really don't even know what got me into them in the first place, but I went back and decided to listen to what made them popular with those big ballad songs, especially the album Dizzy Up the Girl, which has Iris, Black Balloon, and Slide, and then kind of dig further back into some of those other records. Superstar Car Wash is actually a really cool transitionary period for them as well, where you start to hear sort of glimmers of what they would eventually become. But after the huge success that was Dizzy Up the Girl and Iris, they came out with another album that was a little bit darker in terms of its content and even its sound with Gutter Flower. You have the opening song, Big Machine, which was a single, at least there was a music video made for it, but it definitely didn't hit the same levels of success as even like Slide or Black Balloon, but it really drowns you with this huge sound and it kind of sets the stage for what's gonna come next. You get a little bit further into some of the darker lyrical tones of this record, which I later found out were almost directly attributed to a divorce that Johnny Resnick was going through at the time. The two big tracks here, Here Is Gone, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, and then Sympathy, not quite as big, but probably a little bit more familiar than definitely Big Machine or pretty much anything else on this record. But then you have some like pretty aggressive tracks on here, like It's Over, What a Scene, and The Album Closer, which is an awesome track, one of my favorite Goo Goo Dolls cuts, Truth is a Whisper. And when I was really into them, and even up till now, I've always thought that Resnick was one of the better of his contemporaries when it comes to songwriting and craft. Coldplay, Viva La Vida, or Death and All of His Friends? Yes, I know. Coldplay is kind of like Nickelback in a way, where at one point it was one of the most uncool things to listen to. You were often ridiculed for even mentioning that you liked anything other than clocks, which you could somehow get away with. But but look, I like them and I still can revisit them to this day and still enjoy a lot of their cuts. I think Parachutes is a fantastic record. Rush of Blood to the Head is okay. I think it's more of a singles album than a full album proper. Same with X and Y. But when Viva La Vida came out and I first heard Violet Hill, I was like, where is this coming from? This is out of left field for this band. And the rest of the album definitely kind of follows suit. While it still has huge anthem ready hooks, especially in songs like the title track, as well as Lovers in Japan, there's a lot of new soundscapes, of course, attributed to their collaboration with Brian Eno on this record. There's a lot of cool, unique sounds and themes that just weren't present on previous outings. And again, this album is deeply personal to me. I followed it from the promotional single all the way up until 
until seeing them live. And this one's a bit more sentimental for me too, because my at the time girlfriend, who is now my wife, was going on a trip to Europe and we had both just got copies of this record. So we listened to it and we had that connection. Even if we couldn't talk to each other, we didn't have cell phones that could text overseas at this point. So I just had to sit around and wait for the one time I got to hear her voice while she was in Europe. And then when she eventually came back and we got to exchange stories. But one of the many things she brought back for me from Europe was a souvenir postcard of that Delacroix painting, Liberty Leading the People, which I still have to this day. And she actually wrote the lyrics of Lovers in Japan on the back. So it's a cute little memento. I still have it. And because of that, this record, along with the memories and the sound itself. I do enjoy this record to this day, but again, there's just a deeper sentimentality for this record for me. What are some memorable albums from your teenage years? Do you still listen to them on a regular basis to this day? Always remember, no matter where you are, we're all living some type life. Later. Thank you.